hopefully this is starting. I'm going to change the title. This is going to be called ESC Final Review Live Stream. We are live. I haven't even taken off my jacket yet. So if you're watching, hang tight, get settled. I'm going to take off my jacket and clean a few things and, oh yeah, charge my phone. Oh, hold on one second. If you're just tuning in, welcome. We're going to get started in just a second with the live stream and the question answering period. It's 301, let's see how this goes. Hopefully everyone can hear me and see me. Um, one person watching, okay. That's a good start. <laughs> so I'll be checking the chat on YouTube and I'll be checking my email. So if you have questions, just roll them in. I'm also gonna make a sign if I have to step away from the computer for a second, I'll put up a sign that says be right back. So. I did get a question on email that says, will the review still be held in the classroom or is it only a live stream? Well, right now I'm at my home so it's just a live stream, but like I said in the email I sent out about an hour ago, um, I'll be there in my office an hour and a half before the final. So if you have any last minute questions, which I'm sure we probably will, you probably will, just come to my office. It's Holt 225A, so I'll answer questions um, right before the final in case you don't get your questions answered here, in case this fails miserably and doesn't go through well. Um, but hopefully it won't. I've never done this before. This is the first time I've tried live streaming anything. <laughs> so let me check my phone email. How to comment. Hmm. How do you comment? If, from what I understand, on YouTube, there you have to log in, but there's a part over to the right where it says chat. And you can, I had some of my friends test it out, you can say something. So I'm going to just type in, this is how to comment. And maybe it'll pop up for everyone else to see. And also, if you... Um, don't have a YouTube account, it seems like the chat might not work. So if you have a question and you can't figure out how to comment, you can just email me. That's fine too. an audio setting I need to change? Um, is it because you can't hear it on your end or is it because I'm not projecting 
um, to anyone. Can any can other people hear this? Like I said, I had someone else try it out, and I was able to be heard. So it might be from your end. You might need to change your audio settings. Could you review the pros and cons of GNL? GMOs. Sure. Awesome. Let me pull up some of my notes. So I'm pulling up information to review the pros and cons of GMOs. Eleven people watching. This is going really good so far. And another benefit is you don't have to use, well, some fossil fuels to plug in your computer and stuff, but you, you don't have to drive to campus, or if you're off campus, you can stay off campus and get all the information. I don't have to drive to campus, so we're saving the planet by doing this awesome live streaming review. Let's see. Okay, so the main pros that I want you to know about genetically modified organisms or GM foods is that um, they're able to have, um, now I'm switching gears from like the uh, getting everything set up mode to actual teaching mode. So the specifically the Roundup Ready crops um, that Monsanto introduced, they are able to have this um, ability to be sprayed with the glyphosate, the Roundup um, herbicide, and survive. So you can kill all the weeds and um, allow the one crop, the corn or the soybeans or what have you, to still survive if um, the Roundup Ready crops are genetically modified to have that inhibitor in place. So it saves the farmers a lot of work. It saves space when you're growing these crops. It saves money for the consumers. You can grow more crops in a smaller area. It has a lot of benefits with soil health because you're not using as harsh of chemicals to kill the weeds that need to be killed. Um, the big con though is that Currently, um, there might be a, a modification to the weeds. So what they're seeing is when they spray this general Roundup pesticide, herbicide, um, that it is not killing all the weeds. So the, the weeds are actually becoming resistant to Roundup, the actual spray. And this could have huge implications. It could mean that they have to change all the genetically modified crops if these weeds continue to become resistant to them. Um, it won't be as effective. It won't be effective at all in the long term. And also, people don't like genetically modified foods. Um, people think they're scary. They don't know what's, um, what's in them, what it means, which is why I wanted to talk about that with you. And also, um, the big thing is with the, the cons of GM is that we're putting a lot of our food production in the hands of very large, very wealthy companies like Monsanto that have the ability to modify these crops and charge whatever they want for them because they're in control of all of our food production. Like a huge amount of our food comes from these large company, companies. And that's the biggest problem. GM foods have been found to be safe thus far, for the most part, but, safe for human health, but that's the big issue in the long run, is that if we allow these companies to control our food production, what is that going to have, what is that going to mean down the road when um, 
we're in dire straits with food supply and we have big lobbyists, big money, just controlling everything and pulling the strings. Can't hear anything, can't hear anything. Is it laggy at all or just me? My live stream health is saying it's kind of slow. So, oh yeah, <laughs> the category is comedy. That's what it defaults to, so. <laughs> Uh, I'll have to change that. So I can hear it. I can hear it on mine. Someone can't hear anything. Try using headphones. Can hear it, but it cuts in and out. Cutting in and out might be something we just have to deal with. I have pretty great um, EBB fiber optic streaming, so I'm not sure why it's saying my video output is low. Um, your YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. As such, viewers will experience buffering. So there might be some lag delay for that. So I'm not sure on my end how to fix that besides the fact that, um, like I said, if my husband were here, he would be able to help. But I'm on my own. So if you, you might want to put that in the comments if you have any thoughts on what I could do to fix the video quality. Going back to comments, so does that answer the question about genetically modified organisms, pros and cons? And I can type up what I wrote or what I said here, I can type it up and send it out to you as well. So I'll type up the questions, I'll type up the answers. Next question, what is MTR for chapter 11? That's mountaintop removal. MTR is mountaintop removal, so I just want you to know basic what is it and why is it bad and um, maybe what type of things it could lead to. Acid deposition is not on the final um, as far as what the specifics of acid deposition, but Mountaintop removal can lead to acid deposition. Mountaintop remover causes overburden. So just the amount of material that's taken off of mountain and literally just shifted over to the side. So you're taking a nice, healthy ecosystem, forested area, river, and you're taking all that biology, that geology, all sorts of matter, and just literally either blowing it up or using a crane to knock off the top of a mountain and moving that material aside to get to the coal inside. So that's the overburden. And it causes acid mine deposition, it causes um, really serious water quality issues when you destroy a whole ecosystem. It destroys the ecosystem services of that mountain, of that region, but especially downhill, when you just get a lot of crap moved off of a mountain, the trees don't hold the erosion, all the sedimentation and um, loose dirt and gravel falls off the side of the mountain, it clogs up streams, clogs up rivers, pollutes streams in that sense, because remember, sedimentation is a type of pollution. It's not something you normally think about, but um, it does cause pollution. It is a form of pollution for waters, so it causes lots of um, chain effects um, down the road for mountaintop removal. Hopefully you guys can hear now So I answered GMOs, mountaintop removal, I'll change my category to um, education or science and technology. Let's do science and technology. By the four ecosystem services, what do you mean? So let me pull that up. I'm going to answer the question on ecosystem services. So there are um, four different types of ecosystem services. I think it's provisioning, supporting, cultural or aesthetic, and then um, the last one I can't even remember because it's not on the final. I don't want you to know those four specifically. I want you to know the definition of ecosystem services and the um, some examples of ecosystem services. So let me pull up that information. Any 
know if there's I haven't played around with the streaming a lot but if there's a way that I can show the slides I'm going this is from the first slide show that I talked about intro to environmental science and it's way at the bottom where I mentioned ecosystem services and this is Ecosystem services are just benefits that the environment provides to us for free. So we would normally have to pay a lot of money to get something like pollination, um, but bees and butterflies and bats and hummingbirds and beetles and ants all pollinate our flowers and trees for free because that's the service provided to us by the ecosystem. So as we are destroying forest, rainforest, and going through mountaintop removal, we're destroying those free services that the environment provides to us. So it's a big concept of environmental science that I want you to know. And we talked about wetlands too and the ecosystem services that um, they provide. There's a whole list of those. Something like water filtration getting chemicals and pollutants out of the water. There's bacteria that's in wetlands that clean the water and pull those toxins out. Um, it slows down the stream energy. So by having a wetland or an area that's really rich and um, has really loose soil or trees with all their roots, if it rains, the soil will slowly filter into the, the or the, yeah, the rain will slowly filter into the soil instead of it just hitting like a concrete parking lot and running off and flooding our streams and our rivers. So these are, these are examples of ecosystem services. And the four types, again, not on the final, supporting, provisioning, re regulating, that's the one I was missing, and cultural. What is the format of the final? The format of the final is going to be very similar to our test. It's going to be multiple choice. Uh-oh. Okay, I just said it cut out for a second. So I'll repeat the question. The format of the final is um, going to be very similar to the exams that we've had. It's going to be multiple choice and true or false. The way I have it right now is it's about 50 questions. I might end up adding a few more, but you can at least bank on 50 questions, maybe 70 questions, 75, something like that. But it won't be significantly longer than the exams. Um, all Scantron, so make sure you bring a Scantron, make sure you have your number two pencil as usual. No math, you don't need a calculator. Um, just really similar in format to all the other exams. Going back to some email questions, externalized cost. Yes, we can talk about externalized cost. So specifically with the story of stuff, um, and I would I would know um, the information on the slide from the story of stuff. I don't even I don't know if I put that on the study guide. But yes, I would know externalized costs, definitely. Um, these are the hidden costs when it comes to buying a product. So examples, we, we watched the video in class and I posted it on Blackboard of the hidden cost of hamburgers. So yeah, you pay three, four dollars for a burger, but what are the hidden costs to the environment or even to the people that produce that product? Um, what? what do they end up paying that you don't pay? As a consumer, you're paying three, four dollars, but in the long run, it's gonna cost a lot more maybe to your health, to the health of the environment, or to the benefit of the, or the lack of benefit of the laborers that produce that product. So this is especially important in things like fast fashion or in like the Story of Stuff video where she was talking about that 4.99 radio. She was like, this doesn't even pay for the shelf space 
on in the store so how am i getting this radio for so cheap while well, your all the externalized costs are hidden you're not seeing the degradation that it comes from mining the um all the parts of that radio and you're not seeing the plastic that's produced and all the environmental costs that it takes to pump the oil out of the ground to make the plastics and the petrochemicals you're not seeing the shipping that it goes from place to place across the world you're not paying for those shipping costs but someone else is and so that's externalized costs so this is why as an environmentalist you know it's reduce reuse recycle so first use less just buy less things overall and then if you need something try to find it um, reused first so go to a secondhand store or uh, find it on eBay and then um, if you have to buy a new item make sure you recycle it or try to get it from not a big box store that sells it for really really cheap because you have all those externalized costs but if you pay for a higher quality item up front and you pay a little bit more for it um, it might the cost to the environment, the cost to the laborers overseas in Indonesia aren't as high. In regards to the guest speaker lecture, what will we know to, need to know about the specific pollution in our area for the final? Well, let me pull up that lecture really quick. Hmm. She, she sent that on, she sent that on my other email and if I go to that email, I will have to log out of my YouTube channel, so I don't want to do that. So hold on, let me find another way to get to that. Hopefully you guys are able to still comment. There's still an issue about how to comment. And again, if you can't comment, if you can't figure out how to comment on YouTube, just send me an email and I'll answer the questions that way. And also this live stream is saved. So if you want to rewatch it, it will save. I'm not sure how long it saves. That's new territory for me as well. Um, but I won't delete this so you can go back and watch me make a fool of myself <laughs> as I answer questions for you. Okay, I'm pulling up the guest lecture on water pollution. And the question specifically was, what do we need to know about specific pollution in our area for the final? also having some issues like it will restart randomly and I'm hoping it's not going to happen in the middle of this live streaming so it's supposed to happen Okay, so I have her lecture. This is Kimmy's lecture. So let me just run through it really quick. I would know the availability of water, fresh water. I would know just different types of water pollution. Um, so we've talked about eutrophication, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus are important. Uh, 
Um, oxygen depletion, that's a type of water pollution. You don't have to know many details about that. Same with microbial pollution, just know that it's a type. Suspended matter, we talked about that a little bit with regards to, especially with regards to ecosystem services. So when rainfall comes and if you have no erosion control, all this dirt and overburden with mountaintop removal is gonna be in the streams and rivers. So that's actually a form of pollution. Chemical pollution is what you most typically think of when you think about water pollution. There's really nasty chemicals getting in our water systems. Heavy metals too. pH can be a type of water pollution too. And um, the, the one I would know too is thermal pollution. So that's just when the water temperature, usually it's when it's warmer than it should be because um, there are chemical companies, there are um, nuclear power plants that have to cool off their water systems, so they end up putting warm water into our water supply, and that warm water lowers the oxygen content of the water, and it causes other problems in the ecosystem, the natural ecosystem of the water. So thermal pollution is an interesting form of water pollution that most people don't think about when they think of water pollution, but actually having warmer than average water temperature is a form of water pollution. So I definitely know that one. And then um, I would also know that Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring and that ignited the um, environmental movement. that the pH, I have talked about that, but the pH of the water can be a form of water pollution if it's too high or too low. The pH imbalance of the water um, can cause problems with the ecosystem in the river. That's as detailed as I think the questions get on the final. Um, there are some specific things she talked about with regard to our our city, um, but I'm pretty sure that's what I want you to know for the final. They're going to be matching. If you're still making the final, one complaint I heard many times about the third exams were the disadvantages of matching. Example, you miss one, by default you have two wrong. That makes sense. And as I um, was grading those, I thought about that too. Um, and I thought, it, I thought it would be easier, like, you know, oh, one just matches up with an, another, you can't overlap them, maybe it would be less confusing, but I can also see the argument of like, oh, you missed one, then you missed two. So, um, and the answer for the final though is there will not be matching. There's no matching on the final because it's, um, those are very specific numbers and um, the only numbers and figures that I want you to know for the final are on the study guide and I have put them clearly on there. So you don't have to know like that eat, saving one hamburger, not eating one hamburger is like saving 350 miles of driving. Um, so there will not be that specific of questions on the final for matching or for yeah, the final exam. Checking my email. I think caught up with all the questions, so that's good. So keep questions rolling in. This is this is going well. questions. I think I've covered everything so far. Let me pull up one thing really quick.
covered everything. Can you explain radi radiative force forcing by the greenhouse effect? Uh, well, first, I don't think that's going to be on the final. I'm pretty sure radiative forcing is something I put that's not on the final. But I'm going to double check that. Because if I did put it on the on the study guide, then yeah, we should talk about it because it's on there, but I'm pretty sure it's not. But I'll still answer, um, give you a definition. Radiative forcing is just the capacity of a gas to absorb or trap heat. Okay, so I didn't say specifically it's not on the final. Um, okay, so yeah. So going back to the climate change PowerPoints. It's still good to know how radiative forcing is different from other definitions. I will say that. So... Um, it's just the ability of a gas to trap heat in the environment, in the atmosphere. So this is um, different from like the greenhouse effect because the greenhouse effect is the whole process. So radiative forcing specifically apply, applies to gases. Greenhouse gases have the capacity to trap heat. That's their definition, the definition of radiative forcing. But the greenhouse effect is the whole process. How solar radiation comes in, how it comes in as all forms of light and then how it's when, it, when it's absorbed um, on the Earth's surface, about 50% of it is absorbed, then it re-radiates as infrared heat, and then that gets trapped by the Earth's atmosphere, and the process is being more aggressive because of greenhouse gases, specifically because of human change, um, greenhouse, or climate change, human-caused climate change. Radiative forcing is just specifically for a gas, okay? But greenhouse effect is the whole process. How much will the extra credit be worth? Probably. So I'm gonna, I'm going to, um, curve the final either the final test or the your final grades and so I will um, add points from if you did the extra credit the volunteering hours you still have extra credit that I never applied from around midterm time so keep that in mind too if you turned in it was um, the three questions about the second exam, I believe. No, it was after the first exam where I said, how did you, how did you do, better or worse? How are you gonna improve studying? And then constructive criticism of the test. So I have that still that I haven't applied. So there's extra credit for volunteering, there's extra credit for that from earlier in the semester, and then there's going to be a final curve, okay? So, Keeping that in mind, I think if you're calculating your grades, I don't want, I risk saying this because I don't want anyone to not study as well, but I'm going to boost your grade some. Um, so I don't want you to think all hope is lost if you get below an 80 on your test or something like that. It only means you can get a B. No, there's going to be, um, there's going to be that extra boost to your grade as well. Okay, can you go over the moon and La Nina? Um, what specifically about the moon are you looking to get answered? 
Because first of all, La Nina is not going to be on the final. I just want you to know the basics of El Nino. So the Enseño, E-N-S-O. El Nino Southern Oscillation. The basics, let me pull up my PowerPoint for that one. I'll wait to hear back. What specifically did you want to talk about with regard to the moon? Now I have all my PowerPoints open and my computer is running a little bit slower. So again, I have a question about the moon, um, but I'm not spe sure specifically what you talk about with regard to the moon. And then I'm looking for my information on El Nino, trying to find exactly what I want you to know. So hang tight for just a second. I'm having trouble pulling up the El Nino stuff, so I'm going to keep looking for that, but keep bringing in questions, and I'll keep searching for my information on that. Okay, so El Nino, not the moon, I see. Uh, so the biggest thing to know about um, El Nino is that in a non-El Nino year, the water in 
over the Pacific Ocean is generally pushed towards Australia and Indonesia and that region. And so it makes it really warm and rainy and wet and it rains down over there. But during El Nino, the pressure changes and so it brings more warm, rainy conditions towards the United States and South America. The biggest thing to know with El Nino is that it turns, especially off the, the coast of South America and Peru in that area, um, it reduces upwelling. So upwelling is when the winds push the water away from the coast and bring nutrient-rich cold water up towards the ocean surface. That attracts lots of fish because they like the nutrient-rich um, organisms that eat those um, all the algae and everything in the ocean during those conditions. So that occurs on a regular year. Upwelling occurs on a regular non-El Nino year where the winds push away towards Australia and upwelling occurs, bringing nutrient-rich cold water towards the surface. But in El Nino years, the winds aren't pushed away from the coast of South America and so upwelling does not occur. So it results in lower fish catches during El Nino years and changes that whole um, economy during those years. So, um, and it doesn't just affect the Pacific Ocean. I mean, it's mainly concentrated, all the effects are concentrated in the Pacific Ocean, but El Nino changes occur all around the world too. So that's El Nino. And La Nina is just like regular but intensified versions of regular weather patterns, just in case you're wondering, but that won't be on your final. Okay, and then explaining ocean conveyor belt. All right, so um, the ocean conveyor belt is this huge global system that occurs and all our oceans and they're connected for the most part and what drives the ocean conveyor belt is the differential between the warm um, less salty less dense water at the top that kind of sits over the top of the ocean and the top of the layer top layer of the ocean and then you don't have to know this term but there's a thermo um, actually Haline. Yeah, thermohaline drop. And that just that means there's a differential between the temperature and the salt content at a certain point in the ocean. Okay, so there's a differential. Warm, less dense, less salty water on top. And then the cold, very dense, very salty water on the bottom. All right? So when at a certain point, I think it's over by like Greenland, that water um, starts to evaporate and it makes it really um, salty because a lot of the water on top is evaporating getting pulled up into the air and then you're left with the salt left over so then that salt sinks and as the salt sinks to the bottom that it creates like an underwater um, an underwater waterfall where you're just getting like all this water rushing down because so much of the water is evaporating and then the salty residue, the salty water left over is just falling and sinking. And that's where the, the crux of the ocean conveyor belt occurs, right around Greenland. And so if that drives all the other ocean patterns as well as wind patterns too. But the big thing to know with ocean conveyor belt is that based on where um, like Europe and like the United Kingdom and all those parts are in the world, they should be really, really cold. But because of the ocean conveyor belt and then the winds that are carried along with that, it brings really warm, really rainy conditions to parts of the world that normally would be very, very cold. So in the case of climate change, if the ocean con conveyor belt does indeed stop, slow down or stop, which some scientists have predicted, it will bring a mini ice age to parts of Europe is what is predicted to happen. And a lot of other changes. Um, I think we watched that video, like how 
if we didn't have this cycling, this isn't on your final, this is just for your information, but if we didn't have that cycling um, of bringing oxygen rich, cold water um, throughout the globe, then we're gonna, re it results in like all this really anaerobic, anoxic conditions where bacteria starts to grow and it, it will turn our oceans into big pits of anoxic um, microbial, like swampy conditions where it will release hydrogen sulfide and all sorts of nastiness. So having the ocean conveyor belt is really, really important for our, the, um, the health of our oceans, the health of our planet, and hopefully it will not slow down <laughs> or stop. So that's the big picture. The big thing I want you to know is how it, how it occurs with the differential between the, um, the warm, less dense, less salty water on top, and then the cool, denser, salty water on bottom, and that drives the conveyor belt, and then how it brings warm water to places in Europe, or warm air to places in Europe. Um, okay. When calculating the grades, does the final exam only replace the lowest test score, or will it also count twice? So if your final exam grade is higher than one of your tests, well, any of your tests, but if it's a higher, at least higher than one of your tests, your lowest test will be dropped and your final will be counted twice. Okay? So, your final will only be counted twice if it's higher than at least one of your other test grades. If your final exam grade is lower than your test grades, then um, I will count every test once. So all your exams and then your final grade will be counted once. Does that make sense? So I'm only gonna double count the final if you earn a higher grade on the final than you do you did on one of your other tests. And I'm gonna drop your lowest test grade. Is half-life of uranium going to be on the test? The specific, like knowing the specific half-life of uranium will not be on the test. I'm not going to ask you what is the half-life of uranium. What I will ask you is, given the half-life of this element, what does that mean? So um, we'll go over half-life really quick. So the half-life is the time it takes for a radioactive element to degrade half of its mass. So if you have two grams of uranium, and then I don't remember its half-life, it's a long time. Um, let's say, I'm making this up, let's say it's 24 years. I'll say, after 24 years, how much of two grams of uranium was left? The answer is gonna be one gram of uranium because in one half-life, 24 years, again, I don't know if that's the exact half-life, I'm just making that up. Um, in one half-life, exactly half of that matter has degraded. And that's how you measure radioactive de decay because otherwise you don't know which atoms are gonna degrade at which speed. So you just have to say it's only half of that matter. Now after two half-lives, it would be 0.5 grams left because half of that is left. So after 48 years, 0.5 grams of that uranium, given that half-life, is going to be in existence. Could you go into detail about byproducts of coal production? By this, do you just mean coal slurry and flash? Yes, that's, um, that's what I mean. So just know that there are products of coal that come from either cleaning it or refining it or filtering it, um, crushing it, um, such as coal slurry and fly ash. Hold on. And know the spills that are associated with those. So for example, the Kingston fly ash spill, which is a huge spill and not many people are aware of it, much less that it happened in our own backyard. 
and then um, Big Sandy River was a cold slurry spill. I'm looking up a few more things, making sure I have everything said that I want to say about that. Yeah, and um, in, in cold slurry and fly ash, those are unregulated. Um, again, each state has its own level of regulations, but federally, there's no law on what to do with those, which is why one of the questions on the test was, you know, why do most plants keep the fly ash on site and, like, just have it in a retaining wall? And it's really because there's no regulation on where to move it to and how to dispose of it properly. So the cheapest thing to do is just keep it right there, even though leaks will happen and spills will occur. Um, but because there's no government or n nobody saying, hey, you have to dispose of this properly or else we're going to fine you, it just stays on site and just stays in a big retention pond and just sits there. Can you talk about nitrogen cycle? I can, but I'm not going to because <laughs> it's not on the test. I mean, I will if you really want me to. We can go over ammonification and denitrification and all sorts of nitrogen fixation. But, I mean, we could just do it if you wanted to, but it's not going to be on the test. So, we can, we can talk about that later. If you want to come to my office and talk about the nitrogen cycle, I will talk about it all day long with you. Well, maybe not all day long, like I have limits, but um, you don't have to worry about those definitions. What do we need to know about Arctic National Wildlife Refuge? Um, the fact that currently there's still a big push to drill in that area and um, it's a big political debate. Uh, the fact that even if we do drill all the reserves from, of oil from Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, it will only provide fossil fuels for about 17 months. Um, so obviously you know where I stand, I'm totally against it, but um, if we destroy an entire healthy ecosystem to provide fossil fuels for less than a year and a half, it doesn't seem worth it. Um, but again, it's mine. You might feel differently. And the fact that they're migrating caribou, not only are there all sorts of really cool wildlife because it's in the northern part of uh, Alaska, so many migrating birds use that region to um, fly back and forth. It's an untouched land. Like this land is one of the biggest expanses of untouched wildlife that we have anywhere in our country and um, to go in and drill it would be devastating I think for just this expanse of beauty that I haven't got to ex gotten to experience yet because I haven't been to Alaska but um, I would like to at some point anyway I digress I think knowing that so many species caribou and many, many others use it, and it would only provide a really minuscule amount of oil reserves, 17 months. Um, that's, that's what I want you to know about that. Proxy data and examples of proxies. Sure. So the biggest thing that I want you to know about proxy data is that they are indirect sources of getting information about Earth's climate in the past, indirectly. 
So compare it with um, like the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. That currently collects data about carbon dioxide emissions and in, in real time. So it's, it's direct, um, direct research, direct examples of what's going on in the Earth's climate. So currently the level is over 400 parts per million carbon dioxide emissions. And I would know that too. So the level is over 400 parts per million carbon dioxide emissions, and that's a direct result of the data being collected at Mauna Loa. Now, proxy data are data that are collected in the past, in Earth's past. So it's not a direct observation, but it's something like tree rings or ice core sediments, where they pull out a huge core in the ice, ice that they can go back thousands hundreds of thousands of years and get atmospheric temperatures, carbon dioxide, rainfall, rate, um, all sorts of other interesting information from Earth's climate in the past. Uh, so like more examples, coral reefs can be used as proxies, um, ocean sediments, lake sediments, and I feel like I'm missing one, pollen, pollen records, those are the big ones. Good questions. Great questions so far. Keep them coming. I'm checking the chat. I'm checking my email. And I'm just still waiting. In the meantime, I mean, we can talk about the nitrogen cycle. Let me pull it up. I just still see that question there. And I didn't want to like ignore your question it's just um, oh those are places to visit I want to go everywhere in Alaska <laughs> I know I want to travel everywhere oh speaking of that tra speaking of traveling so there is and I mentioned this in class but I'm still organizing that trip to Costa Rica for spring break. So if you are interested and you haven't emailed me yet, please do email me and say you're interested. We have 20 spots available. Um, I've already gotten a bunch of people who are interested that I haven't emailed yet. So I'm gathering that information currently and getting that organized if you want to go to Costa Rica and do some really cool work. If not, there are other trips that we are planning on doing. We're planning one in to go to Africa in 2018 and um, hopefully Hawaii um, we'll see where that end up going but um, if you're interested in even getting on that email list I'll keep you updated with more information about that so just email me and say hey I want to be added to the list this is kind of fun I've never done this before so it's almost been an hour. It's awesome. Okay, what was I looking at? I was gonna look up nitrogen cycle, right? But again, the nitrogen cycle is not gonna be on the test, but we can go over the definitions if you want. If you don't want, you can stop me and say no, never mind. Maybe it's important in your other classes, so. The ones that will be on the test are hydrologic cycle and just the anthropogenic influences of the hydrologic cycle, how we've changed it, and the carbon cycle.
But okay, so the nitrogen cycle, the biggest thing to know, um, and this will be on the test, the final, is that the atmosphere is 78% nitrogen, but it's nitrogen gas. So most people think the atmosphere is oxygen, mainly oxygen, and it's about 20% oxygen, but most of our atmosphere is nitrogen. The problem is plants need nitrogen and they can't get it from the air. It's not in a way that's available to them. A plant can just, can't just can just absorb nitrogen gas out of the air because it has a really strong three-part bond. So it has to be fixed. And we figured out how to fix it um, using certain chemicals and process industrial processes. But, and, but naturally, it can only be fixed by bacteria or lightning strikes. Um, so there's bacteria living in the ground that fix nitrogen. They take N2 gas and they change it into ammonia. Um, so that's called nitrogen fixation. And then ammonia can go from, that's its form, um, either ammonia or ammonium, um, into nitrates or nitrites. And that's nitrification. Um, and from either form, nitrate or ammonia, that can be assimilated into plant tissue assimilation. And that's how nitrogen can be absorbed into a plant, but it has to go through fixation first, at least, or fixation, and then the two-part nitrification. Ammoniification is when the um, living organism, such as a plant or an animal, dies or goes to the bathroom, and then its waste product is translated back to ammonia. And then denitrification is taking nitrates and denitrifying it back to N2 gas and putting it back into the atmosphere. And that happens in the soil as well. Oh, I'm losing people. Seven people are watching now. Any other questions? people watching we're dropping like flies well I'll be here for about another five minutes I'll just wait and see if you have any more questions coming in um, if not you're free to move on and get back to studying um, I hope your weekend you do at least one fun thing this weekend you don't spend all weekend studying for finals I know that might not be the case but we're almost there Final push, I can tell you the final is not um, going to be as technical as some of the other exams. So, so don't get caught up studying too many details, but just know those broad stretches of information that I'm talking about on the study guide, okay? But I'll sit here a few more minutes, see if any other questions roll in. If not, good luck. Email me with anything, and remember, I'm going to be in my office at 11.30, the day of the test, so you can come to me with questions, too, if you need to, if you think of anything very last minute. I'm there, okay? And I'll try to type up these questions for you, the um, questions I answered, maybe, hopefully. And if not, you can go back over this video. You can watch it again. I'm going over my chat history and just making sure I touched on everything. Okay. On the quiz we took the first day of class, it was a true false Question. Carbon dioxide is not the most potent greenhouse gas. What is the most potent? So the answer is probably chlorofluorocarbon CFCs. Um, they're like thousands of times more potent than carbon dioxide. Um, but the biggest thing I want you to know is that carbon dioxide is not the most potent greenhouse gas. Methane is 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So it's not talked about as much because it's not as prevalent in the atmosphere. 
carbon dioxide is just the most well-known, most um, numerous greenhouse gas with 400 parts per million in the atmosphere currently, and that number is rising. So because most everything we do produces carbon dioxide emissions, um, creating energy and driving cars around, that is why carbon dioxide emissions get kind of the most flack, but it's not the most potent greenhouse gas. Methane is more potent, and you know that comes from enteric fermentation, which is farts, and um, the waste byproduct of cows and even humans. And then other very minuscule, complicated, um, a lot of them are man-made, like the CFCs, and there's one, I think it's like sulfur, carbon sulfur hexide, something like that. It's really, really potent as well. But I won't ask you that. Please show us Eli. Aww. He's um, at daycare today, so I'll have to show you a picture of him. <laughs> okay. Here's a picture we went and visited Santa. Hold on. It's not my favorite, favorite picture of him, but. So there's Eli. And I, I mean, I could show you pictures of him on my phone, but <laughs> that's sweet. He has a really, um, yeah, we do Snapchat and I do Snapchat because my whole family does Snapchat, like my mom and my dad and my aunts and my grandma use Snapchat. So Snapchat is like how I communicate with my family. But so we have a, a bunch of fun like with those fun Snapchat filters and he's like a dog and he's, you know, like licking the screen and it's just really cute. So, um, but yeah, I'm not gonna, maybe I'll put those on Facebook or something. But yeah, anyway, that kind of, uh, Got you real. Oh, wait, one more question. Let's see. What was quiz one again? So that's the, if you go back to the intro for, intro to environmental science, but the very first lecture, I did like a pop quiz kind of, and uh, I asked, um, where do most Tennesseans get their energy from? What, what fuel source? And now I'm sure most of you know that in Tennessee, most of our fuel comes from coal. Not really global or worldwide, but Tennessee specifically. Although we do have a high, um, a high level of n uh, nuclear power for our state. About one third is nuclear. And then um, we're getting more and more hydrofracking and for natural gas and then some hydroelectric, especially here in Chattanooga with the raccoon pump storage facility. So, but mainly coal, most of our energy in Tennessee comes from coal. Um, I asked, you know, scientists agree that the planet is currently warming and climate change scientists, 97% of them say that it's also due to human activity. So as far as the scientific consensus, it's no, no contest, there's more uh, there's more information, there's more scientific agreement, consensus on climate change being human caused than there is on most things that we readily accept as scientific fact. So it's really a, not a scientific debate at all. Um, it's just in the political spectrum, it's become debated very heavily. So we talked about that. Uh, carbon dioxide being the most potent greenhouse gas is not true. We talked about that. Methane's more potent. CFC is more potent. 
And then, um, we didn't really get to the, the semester, but true or false, a natural herbal medicine is safer than the same medicine synthesized in the lab, even though they're chem chemically identical. And it's just getting to test your, do you think the word natural is better than like chemically made? And if they're the exact same product, um, even though one is synthesized in a lab and one is natural from the actual tree or something like that, it's not going to affect your body any differently. And then 